Hello and welcome. Today we are dealing with a difficult subject, namely the subject of the Third Temple. It is becoming increasingly common to hear that the Third Temple is to be built in Jerusalem. The Jews and the Christians assume that this temple must be built before the Messiah comes, because otherwise the Messiah cannot come. This opinion is also very common in the Christian world. One quotes different biblical passages, but there are actually only two which are interesting for it, and we will have a close look at these. To understand this item, it is necessary that you have also seen the first sequences of the rebirth of Jerusalem. So take a look at the first episodes about the rebirth of Jerusalem and come back here later, because without a detailed knowledge of the rebirth of Jerusalem, one cannot understand the third temple and what will happen with it. So let's go in. Historically, there were the following temples. First, there was the Temple of Solomon. That was the first temple that was built. Then there was a second temple that was the Herodian temple. Herod built it around the time of Jesus. It was not yet finished, although the construction work on the essential parts had been completed. This was also the temple that was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And then there will be built the third temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem in the end times. This is at least the general interpretation and expectation of both Jews and Christians. Above all, two Bible passages are quoted, one in 1 Thessalonians 5 and one in Revelation 11. In Revelation 11 is written, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. So it is clearly stated here that John is to measure a temple and an altar. There is an outer court, but he shall not measure it. From these verses, one derives that the temple must be rebuilt in the last time, because the revelation is about the last things, and here the temple is also mentioned. We'll get right back to it later. The second passage is in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Paul says, Do not be seduced, for the Lord does not come unless the garbage comes first, and so on. So here too we are talking about the temple of God. Paul mentions the temple of God for the last time as a clear sign that Christ is coming back soon. And this is the second place from which it is deduced that the temple of God will be there again in the last times. Now it is always assumed, however, that this will somehow be a new building of the temple which was in 70 AD and that such a temple is to be built again in the end times. So on the basis of only these two passages from the Bible, almost all Jewish and Christian commentators assume that the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem in the last days. But if we read the passages carefully, then the Bible does not say at any point that the temple is being built, but the Bible merely assumes that there will be a temple again. In one of the past clips about the two witnesses, we have already seen that in Revelation 11 the city of Jerusalem is meant with the temple of God and the altar. But why exactly is Jerusalem holy? It is holy because it is full of people who then, probably with a Jewish background, came to believe in Jesus Christ. The reason this city is holy is because there are holy people in it. Not holy people in a Catholic sense, but people who have come to believe in Jesus Christ in a New Testament way. But because then the whole city of Jerusalem is full of Christians, John calls it a temple in Revelation 11. But it is a spiritual temple, and that is the great miracle that we have overlooked so far. So when the city of Jerusalem is born again at the end of the church time, then the whole city will be holy in a New Testament sense. Then Jerusalem itself is a temple in the Holy Spirit, just as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 17, and calls the Corinthians themselves a temple of God. He says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are the temple. Paul himself says that the temple of God is to be understood in a spiritual way in the New Testament and consists of living, born-again people, born at that time in Corinth and at the end time again in Jerusalem.
for the Jews who live in Jerusalem at the end time will come out of Judaism to rebirth, to faith in the Messiah Jesus. Just as Paul describes the people of Corinth as the temple of God, the city of Jerusalem will become a temple when it comes to faith. 2000 years ago, the Jewish Christians said, okay, we have now come to believe in the Messiah Jesus, but this applies only to us Jews and not to the Gentiles. But Paul understood that rebirth also applies to the Gentiles. Today, 2000 years later, we see that Paul was right. But for the Jews at that time, it was an incredible thing that the gospel, that the holy God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob would go to the uncircumcised. This was the great scandal of the time for which Paul received much resistance. In the end times, however, all this is exactly the opposite. God goes back from the Gentiles to his people Israel, especially to his city Jerusalem. If we demand that the Jews should have believed Paul, when he said that the gospel has come to us Gentiles, then, so I believe, it is not more than normal if we recognize that at the end of the time God will give the city of Jerusalem the grace that it will also come to faith in Jesus. So the city of Jerusalem is, after a heavy siege by foreign troops, more about this later, full of born-again Jewish Christians and therefore it is a temple in the Holy Spirit and in truth. But this reborn temple will actually be created by the Spirit of God, as predicted in Joel. This temple will not be built with stones and wood. It will be a spiritual temple. This kind of spiritual temple means Revelation 11 and also 2 Thessalonians 2. So if you know about the rebirth of Jerusalem and then read the Bible passages that Paul wrote, for example in 2 Thessalonians 2, then you understand that Paul also knew about the rebirth of Jerusalem. That's a very, very amazing thing. And it is amazing to see that Paul already knew about this mystery of the rebirth of Jerusalem at the end of church time already 2000 years ago. But that's not all, for he has also spoken about it with the Thessalonians, for he writes in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 5, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? So Paul reminds the Thessalonians in his second letter that he did talk to the Christians in Thessaloniki about this topic when he was with them. This is very interesting and you can see here that Paul not only had this knowledge himself, but also preached it to the Thessalonians, although he was only in Thessaloniki for a short time. So Paul spoke to the Thessalonians about the rebirth of Jerusalem in the last days and told them that another temple will come to Jerusalem and that the Antichrist will set himself up in God's temple. However, Paul did not mean a temple of stones and wood. He did not mean a temple built of stones, a temple in which Old Testament sacrifices will be made, but a spiritual temple, because the city of Jerusalem will be born again. Paul could not even proclaim that another temple of stones and wood would be built in Jerusalem, in which again Old Testament sacrifices would be made. That was not the proclamation of Paul at all. Paul knew only one sacrifice, that of our Lord Jesus Christ, who saved, replaced and fulfilled all other sacrifices. So when Paul speaks of the temple for the last days, he knew that Jerusalem would be born again. But then he could not mean an Old Testament temple in which animals would be sacrificed again. In all this, it becomes clear what a great knowledge Paul had from the scriptures. This is also the reason why in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, he cites a birth as a sign of the return of Jesus Christ. He says, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It is unexpected. So this means that Paul did not mean the day of judgment or the day of the rapture or any other day, but specifically the day of the rebirth of Jerusalem. For he connects this causally with the little word for, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them subtly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. It is interesting that Paul compares the return of Christ with the birth pains of a pregnant woman. We now know why. These labor pains, of which Paul writes here in 1 Thessalonians 5, are the destruction that attacks Zion's daughter, who then also gives birth, that is, she comes to rebirth in a hole.
Paul had also spoken about this with the Thessalonians, for he also introduces verse 2 here with the words, For you know very well. Why does he say that? Because Paul talked to them from the Bible about it. It's amazing. Although the Thessalonians were young in faith, Paul entrusted this knowledge to them. It's amazing. So Paul knew of the mystery of the rebirth of Jerusalem and mentions this in 1 Thessalonians 5 in a very close connection with the return of Jesus Christ because he knows that the rebirth of Jerusalem takes place before the return of Jesus and at the beginning of the seventh year week. The seventh year week begins with the rebirth of Jerusalem. We have already talked about this in the clip with the two witnesses. The service of the two witnesses lasts 1,260 days. Then they will be killed by a beast, a political ruler, rising from the abyss. Then the beast reigns further 42 months. That makes together seven years and corresponds to Daniel's missing 17th week of the year. At the very end of these seven years, after the Antichrist has done terrible things in Jerusalem, in Israel and probably also in all his kingdom, Christ comes again and conquers him. Then he establishes his heavenly and earthly kingdom. When Christ returns, it is very likely that the temple of stones and wood will be built again in Jerusalem, similar to the one in Ezekiel. But that would be a fourth temple and not the so-called third temple. When Christ comes again and establishes his kingdom, then of course also a temple and also services belong to it. But what is usually described and interpreted by Christians and Jews as the third temple is a spiritual one. This third temple is created solely by God's spirit. It may be followed then by a fourth temple, the one mentioned in Ezekiel. As Christians, we have God's spirit to understand the Bible. Nevertheless, we may find it somewhat difficult to understand this reverse direction of God's way with Israel. 2000 years ago, the gospel went from the Jews to the Gentiles. But in the last times, the gospel will return from us Gentiles to the Jews again, especially to Jerusalem. All we are supposed to understand is that the so-called third temple will not be built by man, but will be a spiritual temple built through God's spirit. We must learn to think spiritually again, not Jewish. We let ourselves be infected far too much by the Old Testament images, which we adopt in Jerusalem without a New Testament's point of view. From the New Testament's point of view, it makes no sense to expect the third temple made of stones and wood. The question is also, which sacrifices should be sacrificed in it after God has given his son for us to a sacrifice for our guilt? The Christian message to the world for 2000 years has been that Christ's sacrifice alone is enough and has fulfilled and replaced all Old Testament sacrifices. So it would make no sense at all and would be also a regression in the divine revelation of the New Testament if Paul or John had meant that the third temple would be built of stones. Who for example would be the high priest in such a temple? Could we respect him besides Jesus? I don't think so. Such a view makes no sense, neither for Christians nor for Jewish Christians. For after God has sacrificed his son Jesus Christ, he no longer recognizes Old Testament sacrifices, nor a high priest in Old Testament clothes. This is clearly stated in the New Testament in many places. The whole letter to the Hebrews also deals with the fact that only the sacrifice of Jesus is still valid. So it makes no sense at all to expect a temple where anything else is to be sacrificed. Revelation 11 says that people worship in the temple, but it doesn't say that people just pretend to worship. It says that these people actually worship. But worship, according to the New Testament, can only happen when someone is born again. When someone worships God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus says in John chapter 4. A born-again Christian, even if he is a Messianic Jew, will no longer offer Old Testament sacrifices, even not if he is a Christian with a Jewish background. Revelation 11 speaks of Jerusalem as the city where their Lord was crucified. This is the second proof that this chapter talks about the two witnesses as Christians, for in this city their Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. 
But if Christ is their Lord, then these two witnesses are people who live in Jerusalem and are Christians or just have become Christians. Then they will rejoice over Jesus Christ and worship him for his sacrifice on Golgotha. But then they will not make any more Old Testament sacrifices. Anything else makes no sense. But all that can only be understood when we know about the rebirth of Jerusalem. So we have a first temple built by Solomon, a second temple built by Herod, and there will be a third temple which is created by the Spirit of God in the end times, namely the rebirth of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself is then the third temple which was created by the Spirit of God. Probably there will come another fourth temple at the beginning of the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth, as described in Ezekiel, but it will probably not be built until the millennial kingdom in Jerusalem. Perhaps the Jews will build a temple in Jerusalem from stones and wood. Maybe. It's unlikely, but it could be. But the temple which is then built is not necessarily a prerequisite for the return of Jesus, for it is made by man. According to Paul, the only imperative condition for the return of Jesus is the coming of the spiritual temple, which arises in Jerusalem when the city of Jerusalem comes to believe in Jesus Christ. See 1 Thessalonians 5. This is the rebirth of the citizens of Jerusalem and of the house of David, of whom Zechariah writes in Zechariah 12, verse 10. That brings us to the conclusion. Before the return of Jesus Christ, no temple of stone and wood will be built in Jerusalem. At least, this would not be a temple that is in the will of God after he has sacrificed his son Jesus Christ. But when the city of Jerusalem is born again, Christ will come again soon. This is what Paul means by 1 Thessalonians 5. Now we have made some short thoughts about the third temple, which I think are very, very interesting and which represent a new spiritual view Against this background, we need to understand everything that may happen in Jerusalem at present. In conclusion, only the scripture is important, not what we see before our eyes or what we may think, but only what God has laid down in his word. So much for today. All the best. God's blessing and goodbye.